Greetings, uh, I'm Jim Finley. Welcome to Turning to the Mystics. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our time here together. Returning to the Christian mystic, St. Teresa of Avila, to help us to deepen our experience of and response to God's presence in our lives. In the, in the previous session, uh, Kirsten and I engaged in kind of a dialogue, and um, in the context of which I, I introduced Teresa of Avila, a brief sense of her, her life, and then this book, The Interior Castle, which we'll be going through here. One of the great classics in Christian mystical literature. So in this session, I want to uh, be, uh, go over the same text I, I went to previously, in that initial session, but looking at it in a more intimate way. So to uh, I'll read the passage. So this is The Interior Castle, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, uh, chapter 1, first paragraph. In the beginning of the second paragraph. Well, I was beseeching our Lord today that he would speak through me, since I could find nothing to say and had no idea of how to begin to carry out the obligation laid upon me by obedience. A thought occurred to me, which I will now set down in order to have some foundation on which to build. I began to think of the soul as if it were a castle made of a single diamond or a very clear crystal in which there are many rooms, just as in heaven there are many mansions. Now if we think carefully over this, sisters, the soul of the righteous man is nothing but a paradise in which, as God tells us, he takes his delight. For what do you think a room will be like, which is the delight of a king so mighty, so wise, so pure, and so full of all that is good, I can find nothing with which to compare the great beauty of a soul and its great capacity. In fact, however acute our intellects may be, they will no more be able to attain to a comprehension of this than to an understanding of God. For as he himself says, he created us in his image and likeness. Now, if this is so, and it is, there is no point in our fatiguing ourselves by attempting to comprehend the beauty of this castle. For though it is his creature, and there is therefore as much difference between it and God as between creature and creator, the very fact that his majesty says it is made in his image means that we can hardly form any conception of the soul's great dignity and beauty. It is no small pity and should cause us no little shame that through our own fault we do not understand ourselves or know who we are. I'd like to reflect on this. You know, let's say here uh, that we're uh, approaching Teresa. For a, she's kind of turning to her for a spiritual direction, and uh, we're coming to her, saying that we want her to help us to deepen our experience of in response to God's presence in our life. And uh, we, we, we seek her guidance. And so, um, how, do, how do we begin? How does she have us begin? See, how does she begin with this first paragraph? How, how does she begin? Like, what's going on here in this first paragraph? How's, of all the ways to start, what is it that she starts this way? And I think it's this. See, well, how, where are we to begin? We're, we're to begin where we are. Or where are we? So how we tend to approach this is where we are, is where we are in our experience of ourselves. I'm living my life, you're living yours. We're, we're in the midst of a number of situations, some of them painful, some of them wonderful. There's challenges and regrets and struggles and life, life. And also where we are is we're living our life as a man or woman of faith. We have a sense of faith. And 
in the sense of faith returning to God and from this present situation of our busyness and our limitations and our confusion and all the rest of it. And we're seeking how can I enter into a deeper habitual relationship with God, a deeper sense of God's presence in my life, my presence in God. Uh, I, I want to learn to do that. I want to deepen my spiritual life. And so this is where I begin. I begin from the midst of um, sensing how challenging this is. Because I could say, I don't, I don't know quite how to do this. See, I, I, um, how, do I, how do I go about doing this? Because when I pray, uh, there's questions about distractions and how am I to conduct myself and what do I make of this and what do I make of that, all that. And, and I think where Teresa is coming from is <clears throat> she, li she listens to all that and she, says she acknowledges that. But I, I think what she's doing here is she's suggesting we, we, we begin... See, we suggest, we're, although we are there, at a qualitatively deeper level, we're also somewhere else other than that. And that's where she has us start. Because she says, well, let's begin where God tells us that we are in Scripture. You know, let's, if, we, if we take to heart what God reveals to us about the nature of who we are in our situation, Let's start there. And so, where are we? Where are we? And so we we listen to her then, as she 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 she, she says to us, you know, um, you're 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 seeking union with God, is, which is a grace to desire this. But it it is helpful to know, in the light of faith, that. Um, you and God are already one in the intimate and mysterious sense in which in God, God creating you is God's self-donating love. God makes your very soul, that is your very essence of who you are as a person created by God in the image and likeness of God, to be a relational mystery with God, that your, your very soul the very mystery of who you are and the very mystery of who God is are already uh, intertwined in an alchemy of a kind of transubjective communion of a oneness. So when Jesus says, I, I came to you, I, I have life and have it more abundantly, the life is the one life that is at once God's and our own, that we're in a subsisting relation with God in that subsisting relation is our soul, which is our God-given, godly dignity, is our soul. So in effect, then, we're kind of a, 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 we're, we're a relationship with God, seeking God. As we, we're, we're in a subsisting relation of oneness, which is our very reality, because if God would cease loving you into the present moment, at the count of three, at the count of three, you'd vanish, for you're nothing, absolutely nothing, apart from the love of God. She says, because you're a creature, and therefore without God, you're, you're absolutely nothing apart from God. Yet in your very nothingness without God, by the very generosity of God, your very presence is the presence of God, which is the mystery of your soul. Therefore, a place to begin, then, is by taking God seriously, as God reveals to us or invites us to reflect upon the stature and the mystery of our own soul. And so she, she uses then this metaphor of a castle that our soul then uh, must have about it then being such as it is created by God, that your own soul has a quality that it's, it's elegant, um, it's vast, it's uh, mysterious, it's graced, it's luminous, it's inherently holy. And uh, this is the mystery of your soul. And furthermore, not only in reflecting on yourself in this way, on this mystery of your soul, 
component is epithet God, whom the whole universe cannot contain, and who's being poured out and given away in and as the mystery of your own soul and your nothingness without God, that God lives inside of you, in the innermost hidden center of yourself. And therefore, if we think of heaven as where God lives, and if God lives in you, then you're God's heaven. That is, that you're the one in whom God takes his delight. You're the one in whom God delights, that you are uh, the beloved of God, God's heaven. I think a way of... um, Maybe getting at this too is to say, you know, what? say when two people like love each other very, very much, when we love, we're in love with and deeply love someone, we might say that in our love for them, we see their soul. That is, we see in our love for them, we see the preciousness of who they are like the innermost depths of the gift and the miracle of their of their presence. And we also, we also sense then that when we see the soul of a person, which is the preciousness of the person, then we see how grateful they are to be so deeply seen. They, 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 they see that you see in them this preciousness, and that graces them, or that gifts them with that. And so then when they return the favor, by seeing that self-same preciousness in you, that is in their love for you, they see through the appearances, they see through past all the, what all that, it's all that's real in its own right. But but they see this kind of indescribable uh, preciousness of you, that they're empowered to see in you through their love. And you can see that they see you. You can see that you're seen in this mutuality of seeing and being seen by and with each other in love. I think that's why the church speaks of matrimony as a sacrament. But a sacrament of what? It's a sacrament that, that, God, that God sees you, that God, that you're God's beloved, that God sees in you the God-given, godly preciousness of you, in which the very depths of God, by the generosity of God, has been given to you as the very depths and reality of the mystery of your own soul in the presence of God. That God sees that. God sees that. And then, so the next paragraph then, it is no small pity and should cause us no little shame that through our own fault we do not understand ourselves or know who we are. Because here then, I think Teresa helps us by laying bare our situation. This, 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 our situation is God. In God we live and move and have our being. God is, God is our situation. And, the, and the, the, the substance of our very soul is the generosity of God being poured out as this manifested presence of God as our own deepest identity, the mystery of our soul, a God-given, godly nature. But then going back to how we started out, asking for God's help, how am I ever going to be able to figure out how to find you? Now we're able to see that we tend not to see the God-given, godly nature of ourselves subsisting in God, sustained in God. We said not to see that. And uh, therefore, our dilemma then of not seeing this, because we're so, cu- it isn't just that we, I think, it's not just that we, we're not imagining our challenges and our problems and our crises and our struggles. And I'm sharing this with you now in the mix of the pandemic going on and things in my own life. And life's hard. And there's all kinds of challenges and stuff lots going on. It isn't that these aren't real. They are real. It's just that we go around imagining that these conditions that we're in have the final say in who we are. 
we tend not to see that love and love alone has the final say in who we are. Because God is love, being poured out and self-donating love is the very mystery and gift of who we are as our soul. That's the issue. So now our dilemma then becomes something intimate. For now we see our tendency not to see the divinity of ourself that alone is real as a capacity to be actualized. That is, I, I am this because God says so. This is, this is who I am. I am the beloved. The God is seeing me here now. God's seeing you here now through and through and through and through and through. As precious as God is precious, as vast as God is vast. And your nothingness without God and my nothingness without God. This is true. But my situation is I tend not to see what's true. And my, when I hear it, when I hear Teresa talk like this, it sounds so beautiful. And in my heart, I know it's beautiful because it's true. Jesus loves me, yes, I know, for the Bible tells me so. This is the good news. This is really true. But I'm kind of caught in my powerlessness to experientially see and habitually abide in who I know God knows me to be. So this is, a, this is my dilemma. See? And so Teresa says, well, what you're to do then is to realize this dilemma, which is the first mansion of the soul, of the seven mansions. This is the first mansion. Being a riddle to yourself in this graced way is a gift. It's a gift. And so when you, when you go to prayer, when you go to prayer, you know, and you, you, you commit yourself to a daily rendezvous with God, asking God to help you and guide you to habituate yourself to be more habitually aware of this love alone that is ultimately real, of which you tend now to be so unaware. Don't be disheartened if you're discouraged. Don't be, don't, don't be disheartened if it's hard to be faithful to daily meditation. Don't be, don't be disheartened if the pressures of the day tend to intrude themselves upon your quiet time with God, because this is the burden and the gift of being in the first mansion. And uh, so when she speaks of reptiles, later she's going to speak of these, these we realize we get into this state, and, and these, these reptiles, we'll look at next time, these, these reptiles and our habits of the mind and heart that compromise this union that we're looking for. And I would just say for right now, one of the, the, one of the main reptiles is believing that what's possible for us with God is being determined by what is possible for us to attain. And um, so she says, uh, Teresa says, for God's will is that no bounds should be set to his works. And therefore, we should not give authority to our limitations as determining what's possible. But rather, we should learn to trust in God's infinite love for us, revealing to us that even God is possible and is possible for us in the midst of our limitations. So here then, it seems to me, is so where Teresa would have us start. I think she, she quietly asked of us that we would go to a daily quiet time with God. And she says the door through which we enter into this first mansion, she says, is in the first, is, as far as I can understand, she says this in the first mansion, first chapter one, the door of entry into this castle is prayer and meditation. For what is prayer? Prayer is the sincerity of asking for such things. See, that when I, when I come to prayer, she says, that when I go to prayer, she says, the prayer is being aware that when we, is talking to God, and talking to God, being aware of who we're talking to. So when, when, when we talk to God, asking God for this gift that we're asking for, to know that God hears us. And so to know that when we speak, God hears us and is infinitely interested in what we're saying. Because this longing for God is an echo of God's infinite longing for us, which is the grace of this very desire like this. 
And so I think what's being asked of us here then is a kind of a, a patience to let ourselves kind of slowly get acclimated into um, a very subtle, a very delicate um, kind of wondrous way to begin to, to see ourselves and to understand ourselves, to be present in the presence of God seen in this way. So that when we um, sit with the scriptures or pray, we reflect upon things, we reflect upon this, this is our lecture, we reflect upon this, bring this to God. That in the daily rendezvous with God, when the prayer and meditation ends, ask God for the grace not to break the thread of such sensitivity. So that as we go through our day, we look for these little sideways glances, these little hints, these little intimations of this kind of subtle shift in a paradoxical state of realizing God's infinite oneness with us in our powerlessness and weakness, deeply accepted to reciprocate to this love that's sustaining us breath by breath, heartbeat by heartbeat, and to place our trust in that. And to know that this is efficacious unto holiness. If we, if we did nothing more than this, if we did nothing more than be a faithful first mansion person, as we're describing here, so kind of soaked into you, as the way you walk your walk, that'd be an amazing thing. See? What a great, efficacious unto holiness, what a gift. And so then, um, uh, let's bring this to meditation. And um, again, in the meditation here, we'll uh, be sitting in meditation just for a few minutes. But on your own, uh, if you sit in, re in your daily meditation time, you, you can extend the time for the meditation as long as time allows or as long as the inclinations of your heart move you to be in this intimate exchange between yourself and God, loving you and accepting you just as you are. So in this spirit then I invite you to uh, sit straight, hold your hands in prayer, bow. And repeat after me. Be still and know I am God. Be still and know I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be.
Let's slowly say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Mary, Mother of Contemplatives, pray for us. St. John of the Cross, pray for us. St. Teresa of Avila, pray for us. Blessings. Till next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Turning to the Mystics a podcast created by the Centre for Action and Contemplation. We're planning to do episodes that answer your questions. So if you have a question, please email us at podcasts at cac.org or send us a voicemail at cac.org forward slash voicemails. All of this information can be found in the show notes. We'll see you again soon.